and welcome to St. Andrew's Church. For those of you participating right here in the sanctuary and also for those who are joining us online. This morning I would like to spe give a special thank you to Brian Barber who has uh, agreed to fill in for Reverend uh, Ed Hoekstra who is on holiday. I might mention that if you need uh, anything uh, in the area of pastoral care while Reverend Ed is away, that Reverend Scott Sinclair is filling in. You can contact the office to get a hold of him. In the bulletin that you have in your hands, there is an, an, an incorrect message. Next Sunday, we are not having two services. Next Sunday is the last service to have one service only. So 10 o'clock next Sunday, but next Sunday it will be in the CE Hall. It'll be a combined service with both Matthew and Steve leading the music. Uh, our sandwich, or our pantry rather, has changed its hours from 11.30 to 1 o'clock. So if you are dropping off things, please be aware of that. A very special announcement today. This week we had some special things occur. Catherine and Ron celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary. And so did Lorraine and Ted as well. Bruce and Kay celebrated their 58th. And a couple of weeks ago, my husband and I celebrated our 52nd. Uh, harvest happening is coming soon. I hope you're all thinking about that and getting your collectibles collected and your preserves preserved. Uh, don't forget to knit and, uh, and, and start looking for those Christmas decorations that you are tired of but we might think are wonderful. Don't forget to send in our, your pictures of your sunflowers for our contest to see who will get the smallest one and who will get the largest one. And tonight is the second last campfire at Nancy's, so if you haven't been yet and are planning to go, you might want to take in that campfire. But also tonight there is uh, the opportunity for you to attend a concert. The Shoreline Chorus is performing uh, a show at, tonight at Georgian Shores uh, and it's called The Journey Home with all the music f focusing on home. And that's tonight at 7.30. Let us worship God.
Thank you for that, Matthew. That was beautiful. It helped me chill out a bit. Join me, will you, with our call to worship. Sing aloud to God, who is our strength. Raise a shout of joy to the God of all generations. For our God feeds us with the finest wheat. With honey from the rock, God will satisfy. Let us worship the Lord our God. For God has done great things for us. And so we bring God praise. Our opening hymn is Seek Ye First. And that's a theme that's going to come up later. Um, so stand if you can, if you're able. Let us pray. Welcoming God, we lift our praise to you. May you find it holy and acceptable despite our shortcomings. We confess we too often fall short of the kindness and compassion we see in Jesus. We have welcomed us, you have welcomed us like guests to a banquet, yet we sometimes find it hard to welcome a stranger in church. You have shown us what matters most in life, but we are distracted by worries, busy with things, sometimes things that don't really matter. Forgive us, O oh God, and teach us, show us how to follow your command to not worry and to seek your kingdom first. Teach us to honor you and those we meet every day in all we do and say. We pray, we pray this, O oh God, in your name. Amen. So time for a children's story. Um, we have one. We have two. How would you like to join me on the stairs here? And anybody else who feels young at heart. Yeah. Can you see that? <laughs> hey, perfect. Patrick and Joel, good to see you. So what I have here is a plant. And I want to ask you guys, what do you, can you suggest some things that need to be done to keep the plant looking its best? Any ideas? Um, maybe less waste. Less waste? Yeah, because um, less pollution. You're right, that's a very good point, because plants do help clean our air. What, can, what other things need, does a plant need? Water, yes, very good. What else? Soil. Soil. Um, anything else? I'm thinking bees. Air. air. I'm thinking bees. What do bees do with plants? If bees didn't exist, nothing would exist. Why is that? <laughs> Pollinate? Pollinate, you got it, that's right. What about when this plant gets too big for the pot, what needs to happen then? Um, you need to put it outside. 
I need to put it outside or maybe in a bigger pot. So you talked about waste. Sometimes we use compost to fertilize, right? So, and sometimes it needs to be protected, right? It needs to be protected from somebody stepping on it or uh, anything like that. So whose job is it to do those things? Say again? The parents? Okay, good. The gardeners, the parents? Sorry? Yes? So, um, what, some things we can do, some things we can't do. Like, send the rain, send the sun. Some things we have to do, like plant it in a bigger pot or put it in the garden. It's the same way, the same way people look after and protect plants, God looks after and protects us. Any ideas how he does that? How does God provide for us? Shelter, okay, that's good. Water. Some things God gives us, like he gives the sun and the rain for plants. He gives us things. And other ways God looks after us is by sending other people, other people to help us. If we can keep that in mind, if we think of the plant, how we look after the plant, and God looks after the plant, it's like a joint effort. And it's the same thing with God looking after us. It's a joint effort. God looks after us, and sometimes he sends people to help with that job. Let's have a quick prayer. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. For all you do for us. For all you do for us. All you do for us directly. And all you do through other people. And all you do through other people. Thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for this beautiful day. That you sent us. That you sent us. We pray in Jesus' name. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, guys. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Scripture lesson this morning is done in two parts. The first part is from Matthew 6, verses 25 to 34. Do not worry. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the, and the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you by worrying can add a single hour to your span of life? Why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. And yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grasses of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, what will we eat? Or what will we drink? Or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who seek all these things. And indeed, your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble 
is enough for today. The second scripture reading is from Matthew 25, verses 34 to 40. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, and thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you as a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick and in prison and visited you? And the king answered them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to the one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it to me. This is the word of the Lord.
Thank you. That was beautiful. So chill out. That can mean a number of things. I mean, it can mean calm down, it can mean relax. I've said it to myself quite a few times this week in getting ready for today. I haven't done anything like this before, and uh, when uh, Reverend Ed asked, I was reminded of my own words that all of us, everybody, somewhere deep down has a sermon in them. So this is mine. Our journey, our faith journeys, have taught us all many lessons. I want to share some of the things that God has shown me, or hit me up on the side of the head with, uh, over the years. It is my prayer, as it is all of our prayers, that our journey, lessons we've learned, can be of value to someone else. As Christians, we like to think that life should be as good as it possibly can for ourselves and for others. As a community of faith, I think we have an obligation to try to make it that way for, for others. Others in here, outside these walls, at home, at work, school, in the hospital, or perhaps a nursing home, at a cottage, and yep, even in the prisons. Even the cheeriest, most optimistic of us here has had bad times one time, once in a while, okay? It may have been something of a minor setback or something huge like an illness, a depression that set in. Um, chronic pain, loss of a loved one, loss of everything. Yet, you are here now though. Why is that? What helped you get through a hard time? Was it God, prayer, friends coming here? Think about that for a bit. Our scripture readings today suggest we can not worry. We can chill out and not worry about what to eat, what to wear, if sick or in prison, because God will provide if we seek his kingdom. What does that mean in real life terms, though? What about these folks? From my work, from my career in social work, I know that some of these good folks have a faith life and they do believe in God. Others do not. However, God made that same promise to provide to both. He also made that same promise to those who do worry and to those who don't have a worry in the world. We are told not to worry about what we will eat, yet in the prayer Jesus taught us, he tells us to pray for our daily bread so that we have the energy to get through the day. The way the modern world would define poverty, most of the people hearing Jesus' Sermon on the Mount would we'd say they were poor by today's definitions. Most people in that era lived from day to day. For some, what they earned each day was all they had to live on for the next day. Sound familiar? Not a whole lot has changed in 2,000 years. So when Jesus instructed those people to pray for their daily bread or means or work or whatever it was they needed, it resonated deeply with their uh, life experience. People of the ancient world often wore the same one or two sets of clothes until they became threadbare or turned into rags. A large part of each day would be focused on obtaining what they needed, preparing food, finding work, Clearly those he was talking to who were poor would hardly be considered guilty of stockpiling treasures on earth since they weren't even sure where tomorrow's meals would be coming from. The wealthiest of the wealthy have enough bread to feed the world. The poor don't have enough to feed their own families. How does that jive with being told not to worry, to chill out? God said not to worry because he would provide. Wonderful, God will provide. I remember a uh, line from a movie, I can't recall which movie it was, but there was an old fellow and he was saying, um, God said he would provide. I just wish he would provide until he provides. Anyway, in chapter 25 that Bruce read earlier, we see, I was hungry and you fed me, naked and you clothed me, sick or in prison and you visited me, etc. Interesting. God praised those who did the providing that God himself promised to do, and in, following the verse, and in the following verses, God condemned those who did not. What do we make of that? From that scripture, it appears then that doing God's providing is our job. God sent manna from heaven when it was needed, but now is God sending us? Miracles do happen. I wouldn't suggest otherwise. However, 
Rather than sending manna or miracles, God is calling and sending us. Yes, us. We are God's providers. We are God's miracle workers with God's help. What an honor. And in case you don't feel qualified, just remember that throughout the Bible, there were many, many times when God used the most unlikely of people to do his will. Being called is an honor. Since there is no more real heaven, real manna from heaven, as Christians, we are called to do God's bidding. We can do that by letting God work through us and by obeying his command to love one another. God promised to provide, and we are sent to fulfill that promise on God's behalf. God keeps his promise to provide to the world by sending us, okay, but we are not left to do that on our own. We have God who is always with us, and we have each other. Plus, we are given the gift of being able to boldly approach the throne of God to ask for help when we are the ones needing refueling. That is where the, word, the words, give us this day our daily bread or energy, come in. It can be very tiring work, though, and we need to chill out sometimes. Luke 5, verse 16 tells us that even Jesus would often slip away to the wilderness and pray. Take time and chill out with God is what he was doing. Luke 5, same chapter, verses 1 to 3, tell us that one time the crowds were just too much. They were pressing around him, so he got into a boat to retreat from them a little, chill a bit, and teach them from the water, from the boat. While being interviewed once, I was asked if my faith informs my work, and vice versa. I answered that sometimes my work can affirm my faith, but sometimes my work shook it to its very core. When that happened, it often put me in a dark shadow of doubt. But you see, that's precisely where the, our prayer for God to lead us through the valley of the shadow has real meaning. Personally, my faith walk has been a long, slow, growing, and evolving process. And like I said earlier, sometimes the lessons I learned in that, had to be, I had to be hit over the head to get it. Sometimes my growth has been forward and sometimes backward. I heard someone describe their faith journey like this. It's sort of like walking out into the cold waters of Lake Huron. You go in up to your ankles and it's so cold you either stop and get used to it or you retreat back to the beach. Then you venture up further to your knees, to your thighs, to your waist. And before you know it, you dive right in. As we walk with God, our faith increases as the relationship with him becomes stronger. I was just thinking, wouldn't it be nice if our faith was so, has grown to the point where trusting in God was as natural as sitting in a chair. You automatically trust the chair to hold you up without even thinking about it. That's faith. I'm not there yet, but... Faith in God can ignite something in us and inside of us. As our faith grows, we learn how to become the providers for God, God's providers. We may not be the one, of, one of the 52 billionaires in Canada, nor among the 5% who hold 95% of the world's wealth, as mentioned in the last two services by Dick and Tina. But God being with us and helping us, we are well equipped to be providers. Good and bad, us and them, wealthy and poor, citizen and immigrant. This is the language of separation. We are commanded to love one another, which is the language of oneness. The language of oneness includes embracing and treating everyone as equals. Our neighbors, LGBTQ, the poor, the rich, those who, who don't agree with us, those from a different culture, those whose lifestyle we don't like, and even our enemies. Look, Jesus is not telling his followers to quit their jobs. He is not telling us to simply sit idly by and wait for God to supernaturally provide. Nor is he suggesting it's wrong to earn money to provide for our families. He is not telling his followers they should not save for future needs. Even trusting followers of God actually do have worries. And we know that all too well. However, I think one of the things Jesus is saying, that living in constant worry about money is a way of serving money instead of serving God. You cannot serve God and mammon. 
Living in fear, Jesus says, is not the point of real life. You can't add to your lifespan by worrying. And, you, and, he said, don't worry about tomorrow. It has enough trouble of its own. Even though God supplies food and clothing, shelter, and everything we need for life and godliness, that's from uh, 2 Peter 1, verse 3, that is no reason for us to totally chill out and not be concerned about the needs of others. Scientists and social analysts who have studied famines, for example, have come to an interesting conclusion, an indictment almost. The problem is not that there is not enough food, but more often than not, there is a distribution problem, and often for political reasons. It is alleged that political interference in the distribution of other essential needs causes all kinds of inequities in, all, in lots of areas, including medical and housing access, fuel, and even clean water. And we know a lot about that here in our own community. That, that makes it a justice issue. And we are to seek God's justice. Distributing food to starving villages in the Sudan or to refugees in Eritrea is equally important as supporting local initiatives here, like the pantry, OSHARE, the food bank, our own Ukrainian refugee efforts, safe and sound, etc. Fighting for clean water for First Nations communities who lack it is another example of seeking God's justice. In Matthew 26, verse 11, Jesus acknowledged that we will always have the poor with us, but he also affirms that we are obligated to help them as we are able. We must not only provide, we must also work toward justice for them. Mother Teresa said, if you can't feed a hundred people, then feed just one. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it for me. Indeed, sometimes we are the means, the agents, the UPS drivers, if you will, that God uses to provide the clothing, healing, companionship, and food that he promised to his children. God will take care of you so you can seek God's justice and kingdom in this world. Jesus' point is that there is more to life than concern for daily needs, though this may be difficult for some. That's why we're here. That's why we have each other. But Jesus expects his followers to put energy into the things that give more meaning to, to life for others and not just for ourselves. He that will save his own life will lose it. Remember that one. Another quote from Mother Teresa that I really like. She said, I used to believe that prayer changes things. I don't believe that anymore. I believe prayer changes people, and people change things. We need to look at ourselves, really look at ourselves, and ask God to show us, through the examples of Jesus, the things we need to do to change, the things we need to change in ourselves so that we become better disciples and providers to each other. C.S. Lewis said, I do not pray to change God or God's mind. I pray to change me. This photograph was taken um, 10 years and three days ago. It's from NASA. It's an actual photograph. It was taken by the Voyager 1 space probe. Voyager 1 was launched in September of 1977, and it's still, 45 years later, still sending back data. This was the last picture Voyager took before NASA turned off its camera to conserve power. Voyager 1 had just passed beyond the orbit of Pluto and had exited our solar system. And that is where this photo was taken from, over six and a half billion kilometers away. Now, NASA, this now has become a fairly famous photograph, but NASA dubbed it the pale blue dot. And that's after a title of a Carl Sagan book from a few years earlier. Yes, that is our home, 
a tiny, pale, blue dot. That is the home our Lord God created for us in this vast universe. God told us to tend the garden, our home, our pale blue dot. God also told us to look after each other, to love one another. Now, seen from space, that pale blue dot is just too small for us to do otherwise. In looking after the garden and each other, we must strive to look for and discern how God's kingdom is working in the world. We were given a role in God's kingdom and a responsibility to participate in growing God's kingdom by showing acts of love, righteousness, and justice on God's behalf to each other and to the environment. So, how do we do that? We seek. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness on our pale blue dot, and everything else will be taken care of. God promised it. So go, do good, and chill out because God is with you. Amen. So stand, if you will, for our response of him. seated. Let's give thanks for all the abundance God has given us, and as we return some of it to him. Dear God, through your servant in the letter to the Hebrews, you remind us, do not neglect to do good. Share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Oh God, <clears throat> Bless the gifts we bring today. Bless also the gifts of time, talent, and concern we will offer to those around us in your name. We trust that through the power of your spirit, these gifts will accomplish more than we might even imagine. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> in the prayers of the people, let us pray. Good and generous God, <clears throat> in Christ you came to us, 
promising us a life in abundance and telling us not to worry, for you are with us and, w and will provide for us. We give you thanks today for the abundant gifts we receive in Jesus, the assurance of your love day by day, mercy when we recognize our own failings, hope when things seem bleak, energy to make a, distant, a difference through our work and our witness, peace that comes when we trust ourselves in you. Generous God, today we pray for all those whose lives seem empty of peace and joy because they are going through very tough times and friends seem far away because sorrow surrounds them, because their stomachs are empty or their hearts are filled with anger or disappointment. Generous God, you remind, we remember before you those who are without work, those who face discrimination, those who cannot find a way forward, struggle with illness or disability, are powerless in the face of violence. Good and generous God, fill us with the energy and compassion of your spirit. Teach us how to meet our responsibility to reach out to those who are hungry, naked, in prison, or sick. Use us, Lord. May we, be, may we become the gift, the providers, through you, the very manna we have received in Jesus. For it is in your name we pray the words that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever. Amen. Turn to our closing hymn now, Let All Things Now Living. That's number 338, and it's up on the screens. And please stand if you're able. May the Lord our God fill us with the energy and compassion of his spirit. May we, all, may we all become the gift that we received in Jesus and pass that gift along by reaching out to those who are in need. We enter to worship. Now, with God's help, let us leave to serve. Amen. Amen.